another song. Um, you may have guessed that we're doing communion today. And uh, this song, Come In, Come In and Sit Down, um, we're all a part of the family. So join us with this one. Come on. this morning on this Worldwide Communion Sunday, aware of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world who also gather, who also come to share a feast and to hope for a new world, a world of peace, a world of life, a world of love. So let us come and gather and worship the God who calls us, who loves us, who names us. Let's stand and sing our song of praise, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, in excess. Yeah. 
angels adore thee, O pale in their sight. All praise we offer under, O help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Let us pray. Holy God, we do indeed praise and worship you. We give you thanks that you are present here with us in this church, in our lives, in all that is going on in the background of our lives, O oh God, and we pray that you would work in us and through us. And we give you thanks and praise that you are also working in the bigger picture of this world. And we pray, O oh God, that your plan would have its way we pray, O oh God, for heaven on earth, and let us be part of your plan, we pray, in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We've got one kid here. We'll invite all the children to come on down to the front. All right. All right. <laughs> How's everybody today? Good, good. Now, somebody here has a birthday today. Jessica, well, happy birthday to you. That's great. How old are you now? Eight. Very good. Very good. That's great. Now. You know what it is? It's a pot. It's a pot. It was a pot. <laughs> you see? Well... My, my, my daughter makes pottery. Oh, I broke my masterpiece. <laughs> well, she gave it to me, but it had a crack in it, so we put it in the garden so that the squirrels could get something to drink out of, and then uh, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, we'll put it in the passive. Squirrels kicked it. and. <laughs> Put it in the passive tense. It got broken. A anyway, I was hoping to fix it. I was going to try to glue it. And, and then I, I got looking around, and I found something interesting on the Internet. Can we have that first slide? Can you see that? Now, this is, this is something they do in Japan. If a, a pot gets broken... They fix it, and then they put gold on the cracks. Uh, Kintsukuroi, it's called, repairing with gold. Because they believe that things that are broken are more beautiful for being broken. I thought it was a little at first, and then I realized, yeah, there's the one. You can really see it on, the, on those. Isn't that something? That's really something. Well, I was hoping to find somebody that does that, maybe, and get them to do it, because it would be really special. I don't know how to work with gold. Glue it and then get gold paint and paint it. Sounds pretty good. Idea. Sounds pretty good. But you know what that made me think about? Every one of us here gets broken. We get a broken heart, or we get sick, or we have bad things happen to us. Well, I realized that, that God loves us so much that he likes things that are broken and thinks they're more beautiful. So in his eyes, all our brokenness is as if it's been fixed with gold. I don't think he's going to literally paint us gold, but... You're just being real smart, aren't you? <laughs> all right, can you say what it's called? Kintsukuroi? We are Kintsukuroi Christians. We're broken, and we've been fixed by God. But we always have the scars or the cracks. They don't go away. But that makes us more beautiful. 
That's awesome, isn't it? That is something. That is really something. I, I think that's amazing. <laughs> so if we break our leg, we're beautiful, she says. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, as you get older, if you break your leg, when you get older, like me, you're going to feel that every day. It'll come back. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> I'm as old as dirt. <laughs> and every day when you're little, I jumped over a fence once and, and, and I broke my ankle. I caught it. You know those pointy things? Every day I feel that now. But somehow, God sees me as more beautiful for that limp. Hmm? Let's say a prayer. Thank you, God. Thank, Thank you, God. God. That we are broken. That we are broken. And you see us as beautiful. And you see us as beautiful. Amen. 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 All right. Now, do you all know the way to the uh, God's yeah. Playroom? Yeah. Oh, I did. I forgot that question. You haven't said it. You did it last week or the week before. Oh, do you know the question? You, you whisper the question to her and then she can do it. Say it out loud. Who's Father? God. No, that's right. <laughs> but now we got to ask the question. So you just say, Who's Father? Who's Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, now we get to go to the God's <coughs> safe room. And uh, youth are also invited to go out and hang in the uh, Heritage Hall, the hall behind our sanctuary, and they've got their program as well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a little chilly in here this morning. <laughs> I wore my warm gown. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it's 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 not a ploy to get you to, to give more money to our to our church. It's uh, the heat will be turned on. I hear on good authority. I hear uh, on Tuesday we have to have somebody inspect the furnace first. So there you have it. Cuddle up. Um, you might want to introduce yourself first. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to Wall Street Church. On behalf of myself, Pastor Kim, and Pastor Stewart, and our wonderful praise team this morning. We're, we're so glad that you could be worshiping with us today, and we hope that uh, you will experience God's love and uh, just a renewed sense of life this morning. Uh, join us for coffee time after the church, after service in Heritage Hall. Uh, it's always good to connect with each other and get to know folks a little bit better. We want to congratulate three couples in our in our church family this week who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversaries, Ron and Jan Purser, Wayne and Diane Dobb, and Mario and Joyce Ragudo. So congratulations. <laughs> and we wish you all God's warm and rich blessings in, uh, in your continued married life. Um, uh, on, uh, this is a communion Sunday, and our tradition on communion Sundays is to hand out benevolent fund envelopes. That's a special offering that we ask folks to make. The benevolent fund is used to help people in our community who need emergency help with, uh, with food, usually. It's often we're, we give out vouchers to the metro for folks who just can't make it through to the end of the month, um, and sometimes different sort of emergency um, issues like that. So uh, do, if you are able to donate to the Benevolent Fund, we encourage you to do that today. This evening we have our Celebrate Life service and uh, Reverend Pastor Doug Warren will be uh, giving our talk tonight and his talk is when some of your best friends are atheists. Right. So come and hear Doug speak about that. 
If you've been here for a couple of Sundays, you know that we have started a program called The Story. We are engaging in a wonderful program of reading through the Bible using a book uh, that turns the Bible into more of a novel uh, without all of the verses and the repetition. And so we hope that you will join us on that journey. It's not too late. It'll never be too late. There are books for sale in Heritage Hall for $15. This week we're on Chapter 3. For next Sunday, we encourage you to read Chapter 4, which is the Moses and the Exodus. You will have a, a stronger sense of how the Bible ties in uh, different stories if you join us on this adventure. You don't have to, but uh, I promise you that your year will be richer for it, um, for joining us on that, on that study. And there are Bible studies on the story this Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. in the living room and Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in the upper room. There are some wonderful Bible stories. You can also check us out on Facebook, um, The Story at the Wall. There's conversation that happens through the week about the chapter that's been read. Next Sunday, or next weekend, is Thanksgiving, hard to believe, and uh, Wall Street always puts on a giant community Thanksgiving dinner for free for the community and that takes a lot of work and a lot of volunteers and so if you are thinking you'd like to help with that Thanksgiving dinner and you uh, perhaps you could speak to Bernadette wave Bernadette sitting next to Pastor Doug we are also looking for help with our godly play the children's time uh, it, we need helpers door people helpers with with the story time the people who do the story we have we have those people in place but we always need a second helper uh, in case a child needs to go to the washroom or other things but you you can talk to Laurel everybody seems to be over on this side today for how many of you were out to the church last night or the night before for almost Maine wasn't that a marvelous event we <laughs> We hosted a, a dinner theater, and uh, just, just tremendous amounts of work and energy went into producing the theater part of it and the meal part of it. I can't begin to tell you the hours and hours and hours that went in it. Special, special thanks to Lisa LaRue, who directed it. <laughs> and to Bill LaRue, who talked just about anybody into doing, you know, some little piece of uh, serving. <laughs> anyway, I'm not, we're not exactly, it was a church fundraiser, I'm not exactly sure how much was raised, but even if nothing was raised, I know some was raised, uh, it was just a wonderful, a wonderful time to come together and do something really special as a congregation. Thank you also for a, just an amazing meal. I, I, it was such a, end to end, it was wonderful. Great celebration. Let's stand uh, now and uh, greet one another, sharing signs of peace. And now Lily Jean will be reading our scripture for us this morning. And Dustin, for your purposes, she's using Stuart's microphone. We'll see how this works. Is it working? Good. Here we are. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis, the 45th chapter, from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's about the time when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers after all that had happened to him. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me so that no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now you do not and now do not be distressed or angry with yourself. Because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve life. 
for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. In this reading, we hear God's voice. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, just as, as Joseph's words started the healing process between himself and his family, um, this song is about God's healing um, and how he works in our world. Like a healing stream in a barren desert, spirit Like a gentle rain on a thirsty garden, spirit water come to nourish the God is bubbling through the soil to coax a new creation, yearning for an end to want and need. Like a gentle rain, like a river. Strong with the restless current, spirit water rushing on to distant shore. God is carving out a channel in a new direction, calling for an end to hate and war, like a river strong, like a mighty sea. Reaching far horizons, spirit water with the love both deep and wide. God is working in our hearts to shape a new tomorrow. God will always challenge and provide, like a mighty sea, like a river strong, like a gentle rain. Like a healing stream. Let's bow our heads. Holy God, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our midst, and we do indeed pray that you would come and bring to us healing and new life this morning, we pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're on chapter 3 of the story, chapter 3, which is the Joseph narrative. And in my opinion, this is the best story in the Bible. I know I should probably say Jesus is the best story, but from an English lit kind of point of view, this has got every element of a great story. You've got a, pro a protagonist who is completely full of himself uh, and then is humbled and, and, and finds his true purpose in life. You've got, you've got betrayal, you've got, uh, you've got sex, violence, famine, poverty, you've got royalty and power 
and re potential revenge, and finally, uh, redemption and reconciliation. The only thing missing is a good car chase, right? <laughs> Hollywood would be all over it otherwise. Joseph was the favorite son of his father. We're talking a dysfunctional family here. A family maybe like yours and mine, a dysfunctional family, a father who favors one son, one son because he was the son of his, the wife that he truly loved. There's more to that story, but anyway. Um, and so he, he, he spoils them. He gives this son a fancy coat of many colors, and all of the other sons, the other nine sons, know full well that Joseph is the favorite son. And Joseph doesn't know well enough not to flaunt that. The tipping point with his brothers came when he told his brothers about these great dreams he'd been having, about how they all bow down to him, how wonderful he is. His brothers are mostly bigger and older than he is, and that's the tipping point. They, they just can't take it anymore. They're a long way from home, and no one's going to know, so they plot to kill him. One of the other brothers says, no, no, let's just stick him in a pit. And they do. They throw him in a pit. They're going to abandon him. But all of a sudden, a group of Ishmaelites come, a caravan of Ishmaelites come wandering by, and they decide to sell him to this caravan. They take his fancy dancy coat, they slaughter a goat, cover it in blood, bring it back to their father, and say that a wild animal must have got Joseph. Their father is absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated, and vows to take his grief to the grave. Meanwhile, Joseph ends up in Egypt and is sold as a slave to a very good household, a Potiphar's, captain of the, captain of the guard. And Joseph's tragic betrayal starts to take a turn for the better. As in, once he's in Potiphar's house, he's recognized for his skill. He's intelligent. He's, he's very good at managing things. And eventually, he rises to the point where he, is the, he, he heads up the whole household and manages Potiphar's household. He's given all of Potiphar's trust. Things get better, and then Joseph is shafted again by his employer, well actually by his employer's wife, who decides she wants to have an affair with this young and attractive and engaging young man. But when he refuses time and time again, she eventually accuses him of attempted rape, and Joseph is sent to prison, thrown away the key and forgotten. First he's betrayed by his brothers, and now he is falsely accused in, in a dungeon, in a, in, a, in a jail. God doesn't forget him in the jail, though he's there for years and years. Eventually, Joseph has the opportunity to interpret a dream that the Pharaoh himself has had. The Pharaoh has this dream and takes it to all his wise men of the, of the kingdom to interpret it, and no one can interpret it. But someone remembers Joseph, that Joseph is able to interpret dreams. Joseph says that it's not him, but God who will interpret the dream. And so it is revealed in this dream that the nation, that Egypt and beyond, will experience a brutal famine for years and years. But that before this famine, there will be years of bumper crops. So the Pharaoh says, well, we need a wise man to manage this. Who is wiser than Joseph, who has been able to interpret this dream? And the Pharaoh places him in charge. Joseph rises to the point where he is second in command. He's the prime minister of Egypt. The, the uh, scripture we read this morning, that Lily Jean read this morning, is the climax of the story. At this point... They are a couple of years into the famine. The famine is widespread, and it reaches even the land of Canaan where Joseph's family is, and the brothers come begging for food from Egypt. 
and it's at this point that there's a real, we're not sure whether Joseph is going to turn on them, but he ends up forgiving them. There's a lot of wonderful things in this story, a lot of amazing miracles, but in my opinion, the change that took place in Joseph's heart was the biggest miracle of all, that he was able to forgive the betrayal of his brothers was the greatest miracle of all. If you have relationships in your family or friends that are causing you grief, I have some good news and some bad news for you this morning. Might as well start with the bad news, get it over with. The bad news is that people rarely change. If you're waiting for someone to admit what a donkey's rear end they've been and how much they've hurt you and that they're so very sorry, you will probably be waiting a very long time. It's not impossible, but it is indeed rare. The bad news is that other people don't change very often. Mark Twain said, don't expect too much of human beings. We were created at the end of the week when God was tired and looking forward to a day off. <laughs> In a way, it's true. Don't expect too much of others. The good news, the good news is though others rarely change, you can change. That's the good news. With God's help, you can change. But, but, but you say, it's not me who needs to change. It's, it's that idiot over there that needs to change, not you. <laughs> <laughs> but if a situation or a person, if you're unable to do something to change a situation or a person, then it's you that needs to change your attitude about that situation or that person. If you don't like the situation, change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. In my experience, we change in two different ways. There's sort of the easy way and the hard way, though frankly they're probably both difficult. I don't think change is easy at all. The easy way is when we're just in a good relationship with God and God when you're in a transforming relationship with God, well, when you're in a relationship with God, it will be transforming. God continually calls us to change and to become the person we were created to be. After service this morning, we'll be celebrating uh, a baptism. And I always say in a baptism that you were created for a reason. For pot you have potential. God has a purpose for you in life. And as we enter into a relationship with God, you will find yourself changing. The Spirit will nudge you to fear less, to, to let go of certain things. So change will happen. But the other way that change happens, perhaps the hard way, is when something difficult happens in our life. That changes us too. And when you put the two together, that's an incredibly powerful combination. God will work in our difficult times. God will use those difficult times. Joseph changed tremendously. I have no doubt. He was no saint. I have no doubt that Joseph was filled with a lot of anger. And I think something happened for him in those years when he was forgotten in prison. I think that if by some weird sequence of events, Joseph had gone uh, straight from being sold into slavery to Egypt and somehow ended straight into uh, the Pharaoh's household second in command, when his brothers showed up, it likely would have been the end of the nation of Israel. They would have been wiped out, not by famine, but by murderous revenge from Joseph. He needed that time in prison, or at least something happened in that time in prison. You see, God will actively work 
with us in difficult times. It's not just that things worked out for Joseph. God was actively working them out. And Joseph, at a certain point, was open to that working out. He was, he was willing to, at a certain point, let go of only looking at himself and his situation of saying over and over, why me? Because that's a trap, why me? You'll never know the why me until your time comes to pass from life through death into eternal life. Then, then we'll know. But right now, why me isn't helpful. At some point, he was able to let go of that question and look up and see God's bigger plan, God's purpose for him. You see, if Joseph's heart had not been changed, the nation of Israel would not have got started. You remember last week. So Joseph is Abraham's great-grandson. You've got Abraham, who's supposed to be the father of many nations. You remember that. Well, he has two sons, Ishmael, whom we don't end up hearing much more about, although remember it's a, it's a caravan of Ishmaelites, descendants of Abraham who come by. Anyway, and Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has ten sons. Now, one of the little things in the story, the book, the story that we're reading that I think they could have made a little clearer is that Jacob goes by two names. God gives Jacob the name Israel. So, so Israel is the name of the nation, but it's also the name of the person. It, it's Jacob. And Jacob's ten sons, plus Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, the twelve sons, become the twelve tribes of Israel, from whom Jesus ends up being descended. Jesus is descended from the tribe of Judah, one of the tribes in the twelve tribes of Israel. Had Joseph not had that change of heart, had he not seen God's bigger plan for his life, the nation of Israel would not have gone on. It was barely begun. There were twelve of them. But God had a bigger plan. God will use your difficult times. God will set you free from your anger and your bitterness, because that's the other important thing. When you don't let those things go, they tend to, it's like a seed is planted in you and it tends to grow, like a cancer inside of you. It grows and it will affect you, it may take over you, and it will affect others as well. But the same thing even more goes when you are able to forgive, when you are able to make a choice to forgive. That will affect you. It will cause life to grow in you, and it will have a ripple effect out. It will affect others as well. You never know how big. I want to tell you about uh, the, a story about a St. Peter's Lutheran Church in uh, rural South Dakota. Back in August of 2000, uh, they had vandals attack the church. The, the, the vandals were, were brutal. They smashed windows. They smashed light fixtures. They slashed a giant painting of Jesus the Good Shepherd. They, they took the gold cross and, and used it as a baseball bat around on, on pews and wrote obscenities all on the walls in, in marker. They went downstairs to the, to the kitchen and smashed dishes. There was just an unbelievable amount of damage uh, and uh, heinous intentional damage done to the church, and the congregation was, was, was devastated. Susan Jansen was the, the vice president of the, of the council, and she said there were just so many tears. Everyone was so devastated and shocked that someone could do this to a church. No one could believe how terrible it was. Well, three months after the vandalism took place, Two area teenagers were arrested, a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old, and uh, they, were, they were tried, 
and uh, uh, released on bail so that they could go and publicly apologize for what they had done before they were to be serve out their sentences. And those teens expected the anger and the public shaming and the public shunning, but they didn't expect what they received. The 19-year-old got up to the lectern and apologized, and when he went to sit down, a member of the congregation stood up and gave him a hug. And then another member stood up and embraced him, and handshakes happened. And after the service, repeatedly members of the congregation said that they forgived these boys. They forgived them, and they said that they would be praying for them and wishing them well. They could not get over this. The families of the boys were so shocked that they ended up joining the church. The father of one of the boys said, we've been separated from organized religion since our oldest daughter died of cancer. We just rejected the whole religion thing. But this event has pulled us back into the church. The treasurer of the church says of their healing, we know the pain the boys and their families are feeling. That's amazing in itself, isn't it? That they're able to see the pain that is in the families and the boys. We felt it was our responsibility not only to forgive them, but also to help them put their lives back together. Absolution is what churches are for. Well, in the months after this tragic vandalism to the church, the church experienced something of a revival. Their, their attendance tripled. And this little declining 117-year-old church all of a sudden, members had more energy and more life. The pastor, Terry Knudsen, compared this whole episode to Joseph and his story. He says, the vandalism was one of our darkest moments. But God can find a way to bring good to evil. That is the gospel truth. God will turn the evil, the dark times, the hurt in your life, and can create something good, something that will grow and will make a difference, will make a difference to you, to your family, and beyond. I was reminded of a song, an old, so an old 70s gospel song by Christy Lane that goes, he never said you'd only see sunshine. He never said there'd be no rain. He only promised a heart full of singing about the very things in life that cause you pain. Give them all, give them all. Give them, give them all to Jesus. Shattered dreams, wounded hearts, broken toys. Give them all, give them all to Jesus. And he will turn your darkness into joy. I'm tired of chasing pretty rainbows. Are you tired of spinning round and round? Wrap up all your shattered dreams of your Give them all, give them all, give them all. Give them all. 
give them all to Jesus, and he will turn your sorrow into joy. This is a place of change, of gluing together the brokenness with the gold of God and his love. But it doesn't happen on its own. We each of us have a part to play, many parts actually. Oh Lord, we give ourselves to you that we might be part of this wonderful answer this blessing, this change, this joy, this place of new beginnings. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Good shepherd of my soul, come dwell within me. Take all I as you are able and join us in the song Let Us Build a House. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live A place where saints and children tell how our hearts are to
reach beyond the wood and stone to heal and strengthen serve and teach and live the world they know in the outcast and the stranger bear the image of God's face let us bring an end to fear and danger all are welcome pray together the prayer following communion. Is there a slide? There we go. For the bread we have eaten, for the wine we have tasted, for the life we have received, we thank you, God. May the sharing and receiving of these gifts remain always in our hearts, and may these gifts fill us with life so that we are able to share our faith in words and in actions of love. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our concluding hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Thou my vision, O joy of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou marvelous, Lord, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my
let us go from this place and may God be our vision. May we see God in our dark times. May we see God in the blessing times. And may we be filled with life, with healing, enough to share. And may the blessings of God, the source of love of Christ Jesus, the love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit loves power, go with you today and forevermore. Amen. And let's reach out and grab a hand or a shoulder as we sing, Go Now in Peace.
Yeah, good job, Sue. See, I can sit there and move that. And so when, when you normally when you look through, you see the bottom, but the neck goes right down through the whole thing. And so the top just floats a little easier, so it vibrates more. And it's, it's electric with our neck, so it's not a stick, which is nice. Yeah. Right? And, uh, well, you know, I would pay if the lights are going wrong.